All right, that works. Then I would like to give the floor to the first proposition speaker to open this debate. Good luck. Can I confirm that I'm audible? <clears throat> POIs in chat, please. Make no mistake, post-colonial African states have been misled and in the false strand of hope in pursuing liberal democracies, they've neglected pressing issues and only furthered the legacy of suffering imposed upon their people. Economic reparations are the prerequisite for all other benefits, political and civil rights are a relief in the relentless limp wind of reality. Our burden on proposition is not to deliver a utopia, but we do think that states would have benefited local populations and on the balance of probabilities created a stronger foundation for them to build and develop into the 21st century. What do we stand for? As these states gained independence, they would prioritize limited political resources into implementing economic changes, such as land redistribution and cash transfer payments. This speech will prove three things. Firstly, economic reparations are likely to be applied best under our side. Second, they bring the most and greatest immediate benefit. And finally, economic reparations are a prerequisite for achieving civil and political rights. Firstly, why economic reparations are more likely to be successfully applied than civil and political rights. And this is crucial because it explains why it's only under proposition that a policy that is likely to be implemented successfully. And note that this argument preemptively will, will respond to all of opposition's benefits because they are all contingent on political and civil rights being carried out successfully. There are three parts of this argument. Firstly, economic reparations are initially more achievable in a post-colonial state. Recognize that the revolutionary leaders, which this debate occurs upon, are not purely altruistic, but they balance genuine desire to help their nation with selfish desire for power. Despots like Mugabe, who have no power to help their nations or who have no desire to help their nations fall out of this debate because of their unwillingness to implement either side's policies in a meaningful manner. So given that, Civil and political rights require a far greater trading off of power because you necessarily set up systems to, on your own demise. Conversely, economic reforms enable leaders to pursue a desire to better their own nation without compromising their own motives of power. That's why leaders like Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana went on to create one-party states to prevent losing their own rule. So what this has established is that leaders both have the incentive and capacity to fail to implement opposition's political rights, whereas they'll be more willing to implement our economic rights. The second part of this argument is to say that even if opposition proves that political rights were initially successful, it's unlikely that they'll be sustained into the future for three reasons. Firstly, because political and civil rights require additional buy-in in the seemingly Western systems of democracy. These populations who have had no encounter with these democracies before necessitate that distrust. Democracy only works effectively if it is engaged with, and without the trust, it will fail. But secondly, because civil and political rights are highly interreliant, such that the failure of one right necessitates the downfall of all others. For example, the right to vote is inconsequential if you lack information because of tight state control. But thirdly, because political rights require additional and continued maintenance, such that the states have the capacity to provide political rights in name without actually doing so, through mechanisms like gerrymandering, voter suppression, and miscounting ballots, all of which are easy to hide versus whilst ob observing land distribution is relatively obvious under our side. So what we know so far is that political rights at the point of implementation do not guarantee the benefits that opposition will claim in the same way how Eritrea was one of the first African nations to have free elections, but was not successful at sustaining them. The final part of this argument is to note that by comparison, economic reparations are likely to succeed after initial application for three reasons. Firstly, because economic reparations provide immediate benefits, even when citizens do not have ideal access to them. Even if you believe that economic re reparations are imperfect, Recognize that partial access to these policies is still good. If you receive a cash transfer, but no land redistribution, it still benefits you, and that is still better than no reparations at all. Compare that to opposition, where the imperfect application of one right harms all the other rights which they try and gain. The second thing to say here is that economic benefits are more easily sustained during a context of political instability in post-colonial Africa. We know that empirically, many African states experienced political turmoil during those periods. Political and civil rights could not have been maintained, whilst the economic benefits we provide before that are given and they are able to remain. But the third thing to say is that unlike opposition, which gets weaker with time as more people lose faith in democracy, economic reparations compound. That's because the economic reparations allow you for continuing development, like educating your children or working in the land that you're given. This allows the benefits we claim to grow over time in comparison to opposition, who will likely have those democracies rapidly backslide. So at the end of this argument, from the under proposition, where a policy is likely to be implemented successfully, and which is what all of opposition's benefits will be contingent on in this debate. I'm now going to move on to my second argument. But before that, I'm happy to take a point of information. How are your operations more sustainable if you don't have property rights? 
So I've just explained that we are likely to be able to have these sorts of things because they compound over time. If you give someone money, for example, you're able to invest that in yourself, you're able to educate yourself, and that necessitates, in fact, if we give them land, they're able to work on that, and that is likely to grow only on the outside. You guys cannot claim that. So secondly, why economic reparations bring the greatest immediate benefit? And this argument explains why even if you believe that both policies in this debate are equally enforceable, you must prioritize economic reparations because they provide the greatest immediate benefit. Side proposition solves the immediate problem of poverty and starvation, which is the greatest impact in this debate. The impacts of political rights are long-term and speculative because they require future action, whilst economic reparations do not and are guaranteed. We look to examples of huge famines in Ethiopia, where 1.2 million people died, a democratic right did nothing to help them. And note that even if opposition tries to claim that they eventually get economic reparations, you must still vote side proposition because of the immediacy of our benefit. Because every day where governments deny economic reparations, thousands more have died. And opposition at this point has an enormous burden in this debate. Tell us how they're going to help people suffering right now, why even in their best case, it is worth having to wait decades to save lives rather than grant immediate economic reparations, which only we can do under our side. Finally, why the prioritization of economic reparations is a necessary prerequisite for achieving civil and political rights. The thesis of this argument is to suggest that, this, that economic reparations are a prerequisite for accessing anything that this opposition wants to claim. So even in opposition's best case, if you believe that those rights are important, you must vote side proposition. That's for two reasons. Firstly, because you have to recognize that individuals need to be economically secure to be politically engaged, because you need time to conduct protests, because the right to vote in name means nothing if one is too hungry to lift the ballot paper, because the right to freedom of the press means nothing if someone is too illiterate because their parents could not afford them to send them to school. Secondly, this is because this would lead to a less power asymmetry between ethnic groups economically, actually increasing civil and political rights effectively because that inequality is lessened and therefore safety increases under our side. All of that is to say that if you want to unlock any civil and political benefits that opposition wants to claim, it is necessary to first achieve a baseline of wealth that only we can access on side proposition. That is what this opposition has to contend with in this debate. By comparison, you are more able to push for civil and political rights when you're in a better economic situation for two key reasons. The first thing to say is because you have more power, you are able to pressure unwilling governments that because of the fact that you hold economic power. That is through the mechanisms like lobbying and platforming politicians by giving them funds to conduct things that could only happen under our side where you have that economic power. That level of government reliance on individuals is how you achieve a voice under our side. But the second thing to say is that for the reasons before, individuals can only mobilize and push for rights when they have that initial economic basis that we provide. Because rather than thinking about how you're going to put the food on the table at night, you can think about who you're going to vote for. You can think about how you're going to enact change. Obviously, we're not saying that these individuals will have all the economic power, but the question you have to ask yourself in this debate is who has comparatively more economic power, which flows into political power for the reasons that we've given. At the end of the speech, economic reparations are a prerequisite for all other benefits. Political and civil rights are a leaf in the relentless wind of reality. That's what this opposition has to contend with. Vote proposition. All right, thank you very much for that speech. And now to open the debate on behalf of the opposition, we go to the first op speaker. Good luck. Can I be seen and heard? Um, once again, verbal POIs from Prop, please. And I'll start my speech in three, two, one. 
proposition cannot claim that civil and political rights cannot sustain when on our side, we literally give people the power to constantly keep government in check and tell it what they want, tell it what they need, keep it accountable. This is why we're more able to also have sustainable mechanisms of keep civil and political rights. Firstly, quickly on our stance and what happens when you're prioritizing civil and political rights or they responding to a chunks of material coming from proposition, then quickly on some rebuttal, then I'll present our own case. Firstly, then on our stance. One, we want African countries to prioritize civil and political rights. But secondly, we're also okay with countries carrying out economic and land reparations on our side if the people in the countries decide to do so, vote for governments that support that. But crucially, the predisposition for reparations, for uh, reparations being care uh, carried out in an okay way, is prioritizing civil and political rights, giving the people the power so they can keep the government accountable to carry out economic distribution correctly. What then happens when you're prioritizing civil and political rights? We think that three things happen. One, you codify those rights. This means rights are written in constitution and laws. Those are very hard to repeal. It's a little constitution, you cannot really challenge it very easily. Secondly, ensuring those uh, governments are going to be ensuring that those rights can be exercised, meaning you'll have the means as a person of Africa to go to court and demand actors in society to respect your rights. But thirdly, we also think that institutionalization of those rights will be pushed forward. This means that governments on our side prioritize building institutions that protect your rights. This means you're ensured more public defenders, more judges, more inspectors that can, for example, come check abuses on your workplace. On proposition, countries have different goals. Those things are crucially left behind, and they're then different on two grounds. One, although they might give you land, you can't be unlawfully detained, you can't be unlawfully stripped of the land that you were given, you don't have the right to let go about your life as you want to. But second, even if the right to land is codified on their side, it's unclear to us to what extent you can exercise this right. This extent is severely limited when you don't have the institutions developed to complain to courts, to have the judges look at your cases. This means that we're already better at achieving the right that the proposition wants to claim. Before I move on to a negation proposition engage. Your side is the status quo. In all of Africa, there's three functioning democracies. How has your side been successful? Can you repeat that? Sorry, the sound was off. Your side is the status quo. In all of Africa, there are three functioning democracies. How has your policy been successful? We think that on our side of the house, it's still better than your side when all the countries are going to be autocratic, when all of the rights of the people of Africa are repealed, when people have no way, a way to be humanized. It's better to have like no, no, weak democracies on our side than no democracy on opposition. Then let's talk about the likelihood of stuff happening, which is the main push coming from first up. We tell you that it's equally likely that both things will be carried out initially because the same amount of power has to be taken from the government. On our side, the power that is taken from the government is that you're probably going to have a bit less control over what's happening with your country, but you're probably okay with that because you want the people of Africa Africa to also be liberated because you were literally fighting for that. On their side, you're probably also having to give away a lot of your land because you're coming from a privileged backer, a lot of your wealth because you're coming from a privileged backer, because colonialism benefited you that you're now in the government. This means that the same amount of power has to be taken away. We tell you that we then win on being able to achieve the rights more sustainability, sustainably, which I'll explain more in our second argument, I'll flag out when I'm telling you this analysis. First argument then, where I shall be clashing with our second argument about how like, rights are, uh, civil and political rights are really principally important. We tell you that civil and political are inherent to someone's dignity and self-determination and thus must be prioritized. This means that people need to be able to decide for themselves about their life choices. This cannot be done when rights are literally being denied to you. When you have like no rights, someone can always make choices instead of you. Someone can always always control your life. Someone can always decide when and what you're allowed to say. Even if the actor making decisions is completely benevolent, you're never seen as a free and worthy individual. Notice that then on proposition, even if you have material freedoms, you're never free because freedom of non-interference has to come before material rights. Otherwise, regardless of whether you have $10 on proposition, or it, like if you cannot control how you spend it, if you cannot unionize to get more than $10, if you cannot decide whether something is more important to you than getting those $10, it, you, this right is equally like less important because it doesn't allow you to access all of the rights that you would actually need. It just assumes that you want those $10. It doesn't really matter what you are accounted for. This means that proposition inherently keeps people of Africa dehumanized because they're always seen as incapable individuals of making decisions for themselves like they were during colonialism when they were literally enslaved. They had no control over the land. They had no they had to work on plantations, etc. This means that specifically in this context, people of Africa deserve and need to be given their dignity back. They were 
strip off of it by oppressive European leaders were the only ones giving it back to them. On the second argument, well, I'll be engaging with more props material. Notice that on proposition, like on opposition, political and uh, political rights and rule of law are crucial for state accountability, and proposition doesn't really have that. Increasing accountability happens on two levels on our side. One, through political rights. Notice that this is especially important to keep government politically accountable because they don't always act benevolently and they don't always have the best intention in mind. Notice that this debate is happening in context of post-colonial society. There is a lack of trust between ethnic groups. The one in power was probably privileged during colonialism and other powers, other ethnic groups are largely going to mistrust this. This incentivizes the people that are in power to act in a not benevolent way because they want to keep those powers, which proposition already characterizes. So, but even if you act benevolently and have incentive to do so, you're not necessarily always acting in the best interest of the people because you don't necessarily know what the people on the ground want and need. So it's crucial to keep the government in check. Political rights are then uh, political rights that do the, do this by directly allowing people to participate in the political life of the country. This means you can go out and vote for the representative that best represents you. This means you have freedom of speech. You can criticize the government that allow like you can criticize the government, but it doesn't give you the needs that you need. You also can go out and protest. You should show the satisfaction with all of the things that the government is doing wrong. This means that only on our side you show the government what you want. You can hold it accountable when it doesn't do that. But secondly. Also through the rule of law. In societies where there are already big disparities between the rich and poor, the rich who want to benefit further and they want to entrench their power into the system, want to get more wealth and more land, this is crucially important for the countries to focus on the rule of law. Rule of law gives the basis for rights being protected, meaning that laws are applied as equally as possible for everyone. This means that someone cannot just come on your land and take it away from you because it is your right to property. And even if they do so, even if they seize your land, this, and your injustices have to be fixed because you can go to court and complain about it. We have three impacts of all of this analysis that I just told you. One, government policies are more likely to be representative of what the people need and want because they're able to express their needs to political rights. So even if proposition gives them some good things, we're able to give them more good things because we give them what they want. Secondly, everyone can demand the same benefits from the state. So because your rights are codified on our side, you can demand your rights being fulfilled to the same extent as the rights of other individuals. Even if in proposition, wealth get distributed to a few individuals in the country, on our side, all individuals have the right to demand it. But thirdly, proposition doesn't necessarily get good land reparations and economic reparations because they don't prioritize civil and political rights. Firstly, we think that government will not redistribute land and economic reparations evenly because one, I already showed you how there's a lack of trust. You're probably likely to prioritize the people that are going to keep you in power. But secondly, you're probably also going to reward the army that literally helped you get in power and helped you through the liberation movement staying in power. This means that the poor people in the country, the one from the most marginalized ethnic minorities will not get land on proposition, those are the ones they want to help the most with starvation that they talk about. They're not actually going to help them. But secondly, even if in the ideal situation for prop, all of the people are getting the land, people will be like taking away the land from the more powerful actors on proposition. Because this happened in Zimbabwe, for example, when a retired army general that had a lot of power violently took over the Alamein farm, consisting of 5,000 hectares of land previously that was redistributed to the people. On our side of the house, those people would have the power to go to courts and say that their rights are being violated and get back the land. This is impossible on proposition. This is why it's far more important to firstly give the people civil and political rights than maybe focus on economic and land operations. Proud to oppose. All right, thank you very much for that speech. We now go back to the proposition for the second prop speaker. Good luck. Thank you. Our, our camera, okay, there we go. Our camera had temporarily disconnected, so it looks like it's back on now. Oh. Just checking that I am audible. Perfect. Uh, in which case, starting the speech in three, 
to one. This debate burdens us with a comparison of post-colonial states as they are, not as side opposition wants them to be. A status quo where only three out of 54 African states has a functioning democracy. So any bit of material they bring you about a perfect functioning constitution, about industry and institutions like Supreme Courts, which are always going to preserve their rights, are a fantasy. They need to deal with the debate as it is, a world in which when these colonial powers withdraw, they leave these countries with nothing. They leave people with institutions that are broken and they allow individuals with power to take hold. What we do is we take the most vulnerable in society, those who cannot even feed themselves as they go to bed at night, and we get their lives to be better, we make them happier. Neither side can claim a utopian benefit, but side proposition can improve lives. We oppose. Two questions before a substantive contribution. Firstly, which side is most important, dealing with their principle? And secondly, which side is better able to achieve and secure rights? On the first, which type of rights are most important? They make one big claim here, which is to say that rights are things inherent to their dignity. But note that underlying every piece of rhetoric they give you is simply an assertion that what people need is agency. We would tell you crucially that economic rights are linked to agency in just the same way. That is to say, it is restricting your agency when you cannot buy food to like feed yourself. It is restriction of your agency when you don't have enough money to send your child to school. All of those things limit your ability to exist like a normal person in society. It is an unfair characterization to say that economic rights don't in the same way restrict people's ability to exist in normal society. What do you know then? You know that dignity and reparation can come from economic rights too. So this debate is not about one where which side is more principled, is which side can actively improve the lives of these individuals. That is what you need to weigh in this debate. Which takes me to the second question. Which side is better able to achieve and secure rights? The first claim they make is about the accountability of these states. Two big responses. First, it is important to note that neither side can change the behaviors of the most dictatorial powers. That is to say, no side, no matter which direction you can take, can change the behaviors of dictators like Mugabe in the types of policy directions they take. It doesn't matter which thing he prioritized, it was always going to be most dictatorial, you're never going to hold him accountable. So what you need to deal with then are those in the middle, those with a level of altruism. What do they tell you? First, that you have a right to protest and a right to freedom of speech, and that is the mechanism through which you hold them accountable. First, we reject that you were able to achieve these rights in and of themselves. That is to say, note how much rhetoric and time they spend on proving how this can like improve the lives of these individuals, but no time proving how these institutions actually enable these people to have these rights. We would tell you through every piece of material at Toby, the fact that individuals see this as an attack on their power, because now these individuals can go out in the street and protest them, is why they are likely to never give these individuals what they need and what they deserve. But secondly, and crucially, even if you can claim freedom of speech or right to assembly, we tell you that you're, if you like need to focus on working 16 hour days in order to get food on the table, if you don't have the ability to protest because you can't read or because you're just like in a rural area that is not interacted with, with the state, you're not able to be successful in that way. Finally then, on the claim about fairness, they tell you that a minority gains a sense of power. Three key responses. Firstly, as I mentioned before, it is important framing that in dictatorial state, states, neither side can change this. But those in which you can, we ask you to be imaginative. That is, obviously, firstly, and this is a piece of framing we gave you earlier, it is less of an attack on individuals' power when you're likely to give them economic rights, so it is less likely that you just give it to your ethnic minority then. But secondly, you need to think of the long term, which is to say, if it is true that some dictators are likely to prioritize some individuals within society and push up their minorities, it is crucial to know that our side only needs one good person with some level of altruism willing to do a good policy. They need to deal with the fact that they need multiple dictators or multiple governments in succession to preserve things like constitution, to preserve things like democratic rights, to be unwilling to repeal everything that has been done previously. So if they want to make this debate about which side gets the greatest, uh, best people in power in terms of like fairness and things like that, they have to deal with the side that is just more likely under their world, uh, that is the status quo, because they have to deal with multiple individuals coming into power and being willing to repeal things like that. But even if it is symmetrical, even if it is unfair, why do we still win this debate? First, because giving a minority economic rights is still a benefit at the point at which it keeps society running. That is to say, if you give a minority of individuals, an ethnic minority, for example, the ability to vote, that doesn't necessarily impact the ability of, other, that doesn't better the ability of other people to exist in society. But if you give people money, it keeps the economy running in an important way. But second, we will tell you that economic rights to these individuals makes their lives better, but doesn't empower them to actively make the lives of others worse. Which is to say, when you give people the right to vote uh, and only give that to a specific group of people, 
they are able to push for policy which actively discriminates a against a certain group, which means in their worlds, what they have to deal with is where a dictator may be unfair, may only give the right to vote uh, or, uh, to a certain number of group of people, and they're able to weaponize that to cause the most harm. What do you know then at the end of this practical clash? Firstly, that we actively better the, these individuals' lives. We make, them, we make them more able to feed themselves. We make them better able to feed their families. We make them able to enjoy life more. That is crucial in that way. Any like, rhetorical example they give you where they haven't done the mechanization to prove why they actually get these changes. Before I get onto my one point of substantive, I'll take a POI if there is one. Minorities on your side can always be unlawfully detained, can always be taken from their land and taken away from your family. On our side, we protect that they can fight for their rights through democratic and uh, civil institutions. No, we reject that premise. Something like saying, now you have the right to protest doesn't actually mean that the state can't just come in and save you if the institutions are against you and if the government is against you, right? Like, obviously, like, it is nice rhetoric, but it doesn't actually equate to change. Point to the status quo, where dictatorial states literally are just going into communities and ripping people out, even though they have a veneer of legitimacy and the veneer of democracy. Just because you say it's democratic doesn't mean it is. You have to deal with the nature of this world that is the status quo. One point of substantive, where economic and land preparation, reparations rather were necessary to prevent state failure. Empirically, we know that these nations do experience enormous instability in the aftermath of colonial withdrawal. It brings conflict, it brings poverty, it brings devastation. Three key ways in which economic rights prevent this instability. First, they stabilize tensions between competing ethnic groups. That is, in the aftermath of colonial withdrawal, ethnic tensions emerge as different groups attempt to control political power. What does this competition look like? It looks like the rise of populist and racist leaders, those who bring about an us birth them mentality, which in and of itself brings instability and brings division. These leaders capitalize on existing economic disparity between groups to support their cause. That is, observing how a colonial regime have benefited some groups more than others, and how post-colonial structures have failed to fix these problems. How do we stop this competition? First, observe that this competition stems from a want to solidify economic prosperity for themselves and their communities. We preempt this competition from existing at all by granting economic rights to all, decreasing perceived inequality and hatred. But second, we just limit economic inequality. You can't foster hatred surrounding post-colonial systems if they give money to everybody. You can't manipulate democracy if you have the power that you have to manipulate because of your economic prosperity is lessened. Secondly, though, we tell you that economic rights foster strong narratives about independence. That is, colonial society acted like wealth extractors. In their departure, what emerged was a sentiment and a fight for independence, which had underpinned the demands to reduce poverty and famine that had ravaged the continent, point to the independent movement which emerged in Mozambique. What does this mean? It is crucial that these states deliver on these economic promises to prove their legitimacy to these populations. Regardless of any benefit that practical uh, the benefit the side opposition can point to, populations can be easily galvanized into riot, riots and violent revolutions against yet another failing system of government, yet another post-colonial structure, which doesn't get them what they want. At the end of this speech, we improved people's lives. We dealt with the status quo like it is, not like we would want it to be. So incredibly proud to propose. All right, thank you very much for that speech. We now go back to the opposition for the second opposition speech. Hi, am I audible? Okay, just a second that I set up my timer and everything. I would prefer the POIs in chat, please. Okay, I'll be starting my speech in three, two, one. At the point of which the government has every reason to just shoot you out in the street because you have no rights, a piece of land does not help you. Before I move on to our constructive, uh, constructive point, a couple of points on fiat, principle, accountability, and lastly, ponder last argument. Firstly, 
they told us that, that we cannot claim a perfect democracy, that we have a limited resources. And yes, we agree. You have some political capital, and this is weak on either side of the house. However, with that political capital, according to the fiat, we can claim that we can ensure some rights. Even if this is a weak democracy, we would rather have a weak democracy than no democracy at all. Okay, to continue now on to their last point that they brought up about state failure. I would like to point out that a lot of this argument is also going to be clashing with my constructive material, which I'll be plugging up. They told us that the only way to stabilize tension in this uh, in this state is by giving everyone economic rights, by giving everyone um, uh, equal opportunities. However, we would like to point out that even in our first uh, in our first speech, we already told you three constructive reasons why this is unlikely to happen. Because firstly, as we told you, these these uh, people in power are afraid of others, afraid of other ethnicities. Second of all, because they want to stay in power, and lastly, because they have an incentive to give more the, uh, more um, resources to their own ethnicities. So we told tell you that it's unlikely and even impossible to achieve this perception that the other ethnicity. Is going to is going to be equal to you with just giving them land. Why? Because you're not going to give them land equally. They're not, you're not going to prioritize their well-being as equally as prioritize the well-being of your own ethnicity. We're talking about the people in power here. So what is there going to happen here? The perception of inferior race is even is it's going to stay. So even if we take them at our best and say, okay, maybe they're going to get some land, what's going to happen then? Because you don't have property rights. By the way, this was an insertion made in their first speech after we we asked them in a POI, how do you sustain these rights? Look, it's still a lot more likely that someone's going to come and take your land away. This is especially relevant for minorities who are still going to be hated on their side of the house. Why are they going to be hated? Well, because you never change the perception that they're not the inferior group in this in this country, rather that they're all equal. And how do you do that? You do that by institution institutionalizing all rights. You do that with ops case. Okay, to continue on to some rebuilding on, on the principle. We tell you that the principle, the, the, the examples that they gave to you, like how it's more important that you get to go to school, how, start, how not being starving is more important. We tell you that all of these things that they tried to claim is completely dependent on the benevolence of their government. This is why we believe that this principle is much more important, even if we take them at their best and say, okay, maybe the government is going to be benevolent. Still, we tell you that these people need the access to self-determination. These people need to be able to decide what they want to do in their uh, in, what they want to do for themselves. They need to be finally be able to have the control because notice we're putting this into post-colonialist context. These are the people that have been for centuries told they're the in inferior race. We tell you that it's much more important to be humanized, to, be, uh, in, uh, to have your hum humanity codified than having a piece of land. Okay, but then secondly, then upon accountability and upon uh, how we're not able to achieve this, we tell you that the, the side pr uh, proposition is being very paternalistic at the point of which they tell you that these poor people cannot change their own uh, their own uh, um, situation. We tell you that this is very uh, this, this is very uncomparative and it's also not put in the real world. Look, we tell you that poor people are very uh, are very capable of changing their own country. They, they're, they're capable of unionizing. We have a lot of examples of that. They're capable of putting ma major mass protests. They're capable to vote in the people that they themselves like. And with that, they're capable to also, also change their country. They're capable of bettering their situation. But before I move on to, um, to additional points, I can take you. Even if you want to take your principle to a vacuum, why isn't your right not to starve just as important as your right to freedom of speech? Because we tell you that this is not what this principle is about. We tell you that your the principle is about you being able to be humanized, about you being the human, you being the, the very equal as every other citizen. We tell you also additionally that the fact that you're starving is contingent on you proving this is going to be something that you will be tackling on your case. We tell you that this is very unlikely because once again, a, a sustainability of these rights on your side of the house was assertion. You gave us no mechanization how exactly these these uh, these rights are going to be sustained. Additionally, we would like to pr prove you, we, uh, we would like to point out the comparison here. What is more important, even if we take them at their best and say these reparations are going to ha be happening? Look, what, at which point are you going to be just shot out in the street? At the point of which the government actually has it written out in their institution that this is something that they cannot do, or at the point of which there's nothing written out in the institution and everything is contingent on the benevolence. 
we tell you then why we are more likely to improve love, to improve love on the side of opposition because we give the people finally give the people to po uh, the power to decide for themselves what they want but continue then on to our constructive the prioritization is very important because we ensure protection on an individual and collective manner look at the point of which as already proven out in the first speech and in the negation you're far less likely to be discriminated on grounds such as national origin social class and things like that this means that the government is much less likely to take you and detain you for whatever which for example happened in the absence of this rights in ghana in 1958 this is a country that did not prioritize civil and political rights they they had a prevent a pre preventative detention bill which was used to essentially silence opposition and silence the critics that they didn't like. And in 1965, over 2,000 people were in detention. We tell you that on the side of uh, opposition, this is much less likely to happen simply because you have things like that prevented in the institution, even if this is a weak, a weak democracy. And additionally, then, second point here under the protection on an individual level, you have you are protected from the intervention of other citizens. As we already told you, there's no insurance of property rights. And in the absence of this, Nothing official eventually pre pre uh, prevents the neighbor or any other person who's more powerful, for example, a person with a gun, to get to your house, to get your property, and just take it away from you. We tell you that it's very important that we institutionalize this. And this is especially important in the context of these reparations. Because look, these reparations, as we tell you, in their best case scenario, is going to be helping only the middle class and the upper class. Why? The weakers are still going to be at loss, simply because these weak people are still going to be the weakest and they have no protection from the state to ensure that they have these rights, that, to ensure that they still have the piece of land that the government gives to them. So we tell you that in perhaps best case scenario, if we say, uh, if you, uh, if we, uh, if we ignore all of the analysis that we given to you that these things are not going to be carried out properly, we still win. But secondly, then on a collective manner, it's very important that we give them a mecha the mecha mechanism of collectively fighting for justice against most powerful actors. Look, the side opposition gives these people the ability to uh, to form unions, ability to form associations. We give them the ability to demand improvement without being at risk for being shot out on the street. And this is exactly what sets us apart from the previous system. Look, the comparative here is that the change on side opposition happens because we can, it can, because we give them the ability to do so, whereas on the side proposition, the, the change is contingent on the benevolence of the government. This is also how we can co-opt the side proposition's benefits, simply because we give these people to ability to achieve these reparations because they can't protest, because they, have, they can't have reforms because of things like that. So the impact here is then the, the existing power imbalances get much smaller. But lastly, on the point of minorities, this is especially detrimental. We already told you that these countries are not homogenous and that the dominant ethnic group still has the incentives to deprioritize the, the other ethnic minorities. Look, they'll be the most harassed, they'll be the most uh, disrespected and the most discriminated. And look, reparations are only going to further this world gap. So what we do here, we give them the ability to, uh, to go to court, to unionize, and we close this discrepancy gap. So because we help the weakest people, because we actually humanize people, that is why you vote side opposition. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that speech. And now we return to the proposition for the third prop speech. Good luck. Assuming that everybody can hear me, I'd like my POIs in the chat.
Team Slovenia simultaneously wants you to believe the governments we are talking about in this debate are governments that are either going to shoot you or governments that are going to see a bit of paper and a constitution that says you have the right to say what you want and then respect it. Because all of their pretty weighing and rhetoric doesn't make sense considering that false dichotomy and choice they prove to you. We say that the cases like absolutely insane despotic leaders, which is all Team Slovenia's case deals with, are outside the scope of this debate. Because in either world, they would not be the actors who are making this decision about whether to prioritize democracy or land rights. Therefore, this debate is one on the marginal grounds of how these leaders would act, assuming that they had the capacity to do this choice and assuming they're not shooting people in the head. I'm gonna ask three questions in this speech. The first is a question of fiat and setting up what this world looks like, what the choices the actors get under our side and their side truly are. Secondly, I'm gonna deal with the principle, which is far too contentious on Team Slovenia's side, even in the abstract. And thirdly, I'm gonna bring you some practical material about how we are the only side that provides an immediate benefit to people who are suffering massively in the status quo. On the first question of fiat, Four things to note here. First of all, this debate is equating different forms of capital. That is to say, if you believe this government is going to either do things like make like a start, make a constitution, we would be directing any capital that we think that would translate to on a monetary basis into action that would directly benefit people. That means on a baseline, you have to believe that we are starting with more immediate economic action, immediate economic action that goes to people. Second of all, in regards to prioritization, it is not fair for Slovenia to say that we get democratic rights and economic rights, but you can't even make a land court. Like in the first place, we think because of the fact this is a prioritized debate, we are able to do things like assume that these leaders aren't gonna immediately take the land right away because of the characterization Slovenia brings you. Third of all, we think they're still like countries can't access these resources in the first place. Obviously, they exist on a spectrum, even if you do not believe that's in fiat. Some many countries do have vast natural resources in the third, fourth place. And last of all, to the extent in which we're talking about nations in these like status quo, the opposition has to deal with this. This is not a speculative debate on their behalf. It is a debate looking into the past, which means that, that is the ground on which this debate is won. Therefore, what we do have to contend with is the actuality of the status quo of what these countries look like. Because according to global reports, three countries in Africa have functioning liberal democracy. That is a whopping statistic considering the accountability they tell you is likely to work. So on this question of accountability, we hear from Slovenia, that you can codify rights, ensure the judiciary and build institutions. Once again, as I'm going to tell you, most of these democracies are likely to be imperfect. This fiat does not assume they can make a beautiful status quo. That means these democracies are susceptible to things like lobbying. They are susceptible to people who are privileged having massive control, and they are susceptible to fools, which is where all of our second speaker substantive takes into place. Second of all, we would tell you voting is not the only means of accountability because obviously to the extent in which these are semi-liberal states that are making this way up in their own heads, they are likely to be to some extent receptive to the needs of their public. This means insane leaders like Mugabe are out. What we are dealing with is leaders who perhaps do want to appease their populations. Therefore, when they tell you about things like we get no democracy and institutions, that doesn't fall. We get a degree of accountability. So do they. The point is that we are not willing to trade that off for people's food. Now, Moving on to the second question about how the principle works in this debate. I think it's really important to bring some clarity on what exactly the world is, because this isn't a question of unionizing and those kind of um, like goals in the first place. This is a world where many colonial leaders had systems of indirect rule. They moved people onto different land. They put them to the least arable sections of the population where they knew they could not farm the land in a sustainable way. They were physically removed from having any ability to thrive. And that's incredibly important because it's not enough to say that these lofty and speculative ideals of democracy are meaningful to people, noting that all their analysis essentially proves that democracy is a good means of getting to an end goal in the first place, assuming it is on the point of agency. We would also tell you that all their analysis about your being in the past, you've been stripped by European leaders, really falls down when you consider how history functions. Because yeah, Rhodesia was nominally a democracy. Many people in these African states are really untrusting of democracies in the first place with good reason. That means all of their analysis that, oh, you know, we need democracy, it is a good system, 
democracy is the first and only economic political system that exists. We think before democracy, pre-colonial pre states had systems of consensus, their own structures that people are far more likely to buy into. So at the point in which you think democracy is a good, it is unclear whether that is a good that will be appreciated in the context of this debate, considering the historical legacy that we're talking about. And lastly, if Saeed Slovenia wants to talk about political vacuums, I think in the abstract, being alive is more important than having the right to say what you want. At the end of that, you know that Side Australia wins this debate just on principled grounds alone, because we are not forcing this system upon um, post-colonial African states, a system which, although tries to profess to give them agency, truly does not in the vast majority of cases, as I'm going to elaborate on now. So on this, the first thing I'm going to establish is why their economic policies fail, because that is the only tangible and concrete benefit they bring in this debate. Three reasons. First of all, you have to believe at the very least there is a trade-off that is happening. We think that at least in the short term, you have to buy that we are the side that will give people cash transfers or they don't. That looks like people not starving. I think that's pretty important. When Malawi in 2002 literally had a famine sweep across the country, they couldn't eat democracy, they were starving. Before I move on, I'll take a point of information. On your side, this is all you're constantly speculating what the people want and the people need. If the people on the country on your side are not going to actually get food, if the people on your side actually need more benefits first, we're actually the side that is guaranteeing that African people can determine what they want for themselves. The point is that assumes that this will be implemented in the fullest way possible. Given the way we tell you that these rights are entirely codependent at the point in which we prove at the very least that they are not implemented perfectly, that is automatically a loss for you. Because money in the hands of people, whether or not they are the poorest people, if those people are not starving, we win. If those people are starving, then we win the debate even by a bigger margin. Then moving on, why all the, econ the economic policies are also likely to fail because in the event they occur, they're unlikely to turn massive public will into something that is effective. We'd say at the point at which decolonization was happening, that was a point where the greatest will to implement economic things. You're not susceptible to lobbies, to interests that are shifting at the point later which democracy is established, noting this exists on a time continuum. Third of all, we think they lose momentum. The UK was perhaps on board of the Lancaster House Agreement initially when decolonization was happening, they're far less likely to do it today. More on this, we say it's far more likely that economic um, rights are far more likely to turn into political rights. This is when we give you from first that is not responded to. That is incredibly important. At the point in which you do not have food on the table, being able to vote doesn't matter when that voting system is dominated by elites when you feel like you have no rights in the first place. Large economic disparities are the reason democracy breaks down. And when democracy breaks down, there is no tangible thing you can cling on to to deliver benefits to these people. Noticing once more all the framing I gave you about ethnic tensions means if there are massive like genocides happening, that is symmetric. But in any way, but based on our second speaker substantive, it is far better for us that we try and undermine these tensions in the first place. At the end of this speech, you must be realistic because an Africa today is an Africa that traded off their potential to do things like cash transfer programs for a desire to institute democracies that have not worked. Because three out of 54 isn't a good statistic. People starving is all the evidence you need, we propose. All right, thank you very much for that speech. And now we go back to the opposition for the op whip. Good luck. Hi, um, can I get a confirmation that I'm 
audible and visible. Okay, cool. Um, let me just set up my papers real quick. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will start my speech in three, two, one. It's pretty arrogant for side of proposition to claim that they know best what is the, like the best solution for the African people. We believe that the African people should have the ability to control their own lives, to actually decide what's best for their own existence instead of a government or proposition telling them, no, 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 trust me, I know better than you. That would, but as if they were told by the colonialists a, a long time ago. Firstly, let's talk about what's more important. So which principle, secondly, on the efficiency, and lastly, which side actually is a better to able to improve situation on the long term. But firstly, let's characterize what is this about, debate actually about. So we tell you on both sides of the house, there's an equal political, like, political capital to do like different things. On their side of the house, whole political capital goes into land redistribution. On our side of the house, however, this goes into like rights, into more political rights, into more like uh, in constitution, into more public defenders, into more judges, into more inspectors and things like that, we have already claimed, right? But then we tell you that Prop does not understand that they claim that this is not about like uh, like uh, autocratic regimes and like, uh, and like despotic leaders. We tell you that yes, exactly, the side that creates the despotic leaders and autocratic regimes on the long Term is actually the side of proposition at the point in which people have no checks and balances, but I will further discuss this later on. Now let's talk about which rights are actually more important, right? We tell you that at the point in which you were told by the colonialists and you were stripped of your human dignity, you were perceived, you were told that you are less than a human being, you were worth less, people were controlling you as if you're as if you're like not a, a full human being that deserves the respect. We tell you that this is at the point in which you necessarily need to be humanized, you need to be to get, regain the control of your own life, you need to get you need to be empowered and you need to have the ability to like control and we tell you that side of proposition didn't actually engage with our actual argument at the point in which they only tell us yeah but this is about freedom of speech no it's not only about freedom of speech it's about the freedom of autonomy it's about being able to control your life and not someone else telling you i know better than you because you're not capable and because you cannot make good decisions this is what side of proposition is doing they're telling these people that they're not capable of making good decisions for themselves we believe this is very paternalistic we believe this is not uh, uh, this is not the right way to go this is why we tell you that at the point where this is like a point of human existence for you to feel in control and for you to feel as if you're worth equally as like your leaders as like your government and as other people in like around you and we tell you this is also the prerequisite for you to fully get the benefits of economic rights because it doesn't mean anything to me that i have a lot of land or that i got crashed from cash transfers at the point in which i will be killed at a protest and to try and to actually get more of these rights or at the point in which someone else will go on my land and actually try to steal it from me and i will i will actually end up without all of this land they tell us that we never responded to this prerequisite but this is the response that came even oh, earlier they tell us no thank you that, they are, that, the, that the, the economic rights are prerequisite for like this civil and political rights, we tell you maybe this is the case, this is best case for them, they never actually proved that, but we tell you that even if it is a prerequisite for you to exercise political and civil rights, they never proved to us the likelihood of this actually happening, right? Even if I have like flour in order, which is a prerequisite for bread, this does not necessarily mean that I'm going to make bread, so they cannot prove that they get civil and political rights on their side of the house, who are able to win this clash on the principle, and we believe we humanize people and we tell them they're capable, on their side of the house, they, they still control them and they still tell them they know better. Secondly, then let's talk about which side actually gets like it improves the lives of people more. We tell you that the side of proposition failed to prove to us why do they get good economic policy, right? Maybe they get it, maybe they get it immediately. Never proved on why is government actually so benevolent that it will give like equal land to all of them. We tell you firstly, there's likelihood of people actually being killed during the process of land distribution, as happened in Zimbabwe, for example. Secondly, we tell you the elites are lucky to get all of this land at the point at which you, as a leader of the movement, at the point at which you, as a government that has no check 
checks and no democratic checks and balances, you have selfish incentive to stay in power and you're, you want to like give the money and the land to the people that you trust. Thirdly, we tell you that they never respond to all of this, then the, 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 the money is going to go to the, like the military generals at the point which these are the people that keep you in power as a government leader. However, on our side of the house, the mechanism for you as a government leader to stay in power is for you to be re-elected. So there's a necessity for you to listen to the people. This is the mechanism in which you stay in power on proposition. The mechanism for you to stay in power is to actually be oppressive government and to give less power to the people, less land to the people, less cash transfers to the people, but also way less rights and actually like backtrack. Before moving on, I can take a POI. Given the instability we've seen in the African continent as a legacy of post-colonization -like is far reaching, do you think that in the case where both policies fail, is it easier for people to hold on to a constitution or a block of land? We believe on our side of the house, we have way more stability at the point in which there's less chaos, at the point in which you're able to go to courts, at the point in which you're able to claim your rights. On your side of the house, you might get or might not get land. You might get the land. This is now I'm going to best case scenario of proposition. Even if there's an ideal land redistribution or cash transfers, there's a high possibility of someone taking it away from you and you having no ability to claim it back because you do not have courts. You do not have the right to complain. You, have, you do not have all of that. Secondly, we also tell you best case scenario for prop, these rights can be revoked in the long term. We see this happening in Zimbabwe at the point in which they're taking the land back away, like uh, away from this. And this is why we're able to win this, right? But then lastly, we also tell you that these policies, they never prove to us why are these policies actually going to be good, right? Because there's no checks and there's no like no one actually asking the people why do they need this or if this is a policy that they specifically need. If I lack education, if I lack hospitals, it does not mean a lot to me if I have a bit more money in, on my bank account at the point in which my grandparents are dying because they aren't able to access the hospital. On our side of the house, however, However, we give people on a comparative way more ability to express their rights because as stated in the motion, dear panel, we give people the right to vote, we give people the right to form associations through which they can actually push and tell the government, we want hospitals, we want cash transfers, we want higher wages and things like that. Firstly, they're able to express that, but secondly, they're able to actually push for that on our side of the house because at the point in which you have all of these mechanisms that are lacking on side of proposition, you can vote, you can sign petitions, you can go to referendums and things like that, and you can use and through these mechanisms actually achieve something. So there's a, a leader that of your government is the one that you elected and the one that actually fulfills your own wants and needs. On side of proposition, there's a random government that does not necessarily know best what the people want. Secondly, we tell you, you're more likely to unionize and have actually ability to unionize at the point in which if you unionize and try to form and try to organize your co-workers, you won't be sent to jail on our side of the house because you have these rights written in the constitution because this is the first thing that happened after the colonialization, right? You can, and you can actually more likely to do that and achieve all of these benefits on our side of the house. On your side of the house, you try to unionize and the government sends you to jail, as happened to a lot of activists in the Egypt, for example, when like people were activists were put on the terrorist list, right? Even though they were simply peacefully protesting. Or in the worst case scenario, on their side of the house, when they want to push, they never prove to us how do they get democratic rights on their side of the house. This is the long-term impact that I'm, that I'm talking about. So we are able to co-opt a lot of the benefits outside of proposition. However, they are never proved to us why are they able to get these rights on their side of the house? We tell it is very, very unlikely at the point in which government has a lot more power on their side of the house because do not give political power to the people. And they're likely to then, at the point in which you protest and the government wants to keep power, it's likely to like shoot you at a protest, which is happening. People are dying at the point in which they protest in at the point in which they protest in Nigeria. And this is what happens on their side. So the people are never able to achieve the, all of these better rights, right? But then lastly, let's talk about the worst case scenario for both sides of the house, right? Their worst side, their worst case is actually maybe getting some like, uh, is, is like actually sliding back into an autocratic regime at the point in which people aren't able to hold you accountable as a government. So on their side of the house, they have a lot of like revolt, they have a lot of violence and an oppressive regime. However, on our side of the house, maybe our worst case is that maybe we do not get a lot of this economic benefits, but at least we have some democratic rights. So at least people are not being killed at the point at which they go on the streets because we're able to win even on our worst case scenario. I'm so proud to propose. All right, thank you very much for that speech. And now we stay with the opposition for the first reply speech of the debate. Good luck.
proposition kept using the rhetoric that colonialists kept using against the people of Africa. They tell them, we know best, we know what's the best thing for you, you should not have the right to decide what you need. We uniquely give the people of Africa humanization, we tell them they can decide what they need, even if this is not perfect at the start, we're able to give them this right to be improved. Firstly, we're already clearly winning on the, those rights are the most important thing, because they never manage to tackle our principle, they just tell you that our principle is not important. Our principle is crucial, because we tell you that we give the people of Africa the right to decide how they're going to control their life. So even if proposition proves to you that cash transfers are going to be perfect, all the people are going to get them, we're unsure as to why people on their side have the right to use this cash in the right way, chose to get this cash instead of investing it to a local hospital, and chose to actually not, to, and are still, why is this more important than you not being too able to be taken away this cash when you're unlawfully thrown in the detention center, tortured for all whatever, whatever means the governments want. The only response they have to all of our claims is then, but the prerequisite for civil and political rights is economic reparations. This all falls if I prove to you, which was already proven through all of our speeches, that you cannot actually like eradicate inequality, that is a prerequisite that they say for achieving like better civil and political rights that it shows, uh, show to you in second speech, but drop in third. Then let's talk about the propositions back to victory. We tell you that the only propositions back to victory is the likelihood analysis of what is actually going to stay true. We tell you that they tell you like civil and political rights will be repeated because governments are not willing to give out their power and because democracies are sustainable to lobbying. Times and times again, we have shown to you that we are more likely to have accountability in a democratic regime when you're able to have means and checks of the power as compared to an autocratic regimes on the side of a proposition. This means that on our side of the house, you have a lot of mechanisms to keep the government checked. Voting, criticizing the government, going out to protest, but also forming civil unions, labor unions, to go against your employee when he's denying you the right to like uh, to go to go out and get a higher wage. This means that we can achieve far more things for the people, especially those pieces that they want. Even if those things are weak at the start, we can see that they might be because there's a limited political capital. They exist and people are able to improve that and they're more likely then to keep those rights. Crucially, that doesn't exist on prop and here's why they lose the debate. One, because this means this entirety of analysis means that the land reparations are going to fail and their entire case falls because of this. The prerequisite analysis I mentioned earlier then uh, relies on you being able to achieve economic and land reparations first. This does not happen because you're not distributing the land correctly. You're not giving it to the most vulnerable people. The government wants to hold in power, wants to keep in check and aren't going to give the cash away from themselves, they might be giving it to the elite, they might be giving it to the people that are close to them, they might be giving it to the party, but the most vulnerable people are never going to get it. So I'm unsure as to why their prerequisite analysis actually improves on their side. But secondly, also about starvation, they never show to you why minorities in the country are actually going to get land, why minorities in the country are actually going to be able to benefit from their policy. It's far more likely that minorities in the country benefit from our policies, because even if the constitution is weak, even if the democracy, in the democratic institutions are weak, minorities are able to go out and protest. It's not a prerequisite that you're not starting to go out and protest. People are literally able to unionize in uh, like the worst conditions possible because they know that they want to improve their conditions. We already give you that analysis. And lastly, the harm that they do is crucial because it, the harm that they actually do is that the people are not going to be deciding on their side. This is very important because one, you are not actually giving the people what they want. I'm unsure as to why people would be prioritizing cash transfer in an institution where they don't have roads, when they don't have like uh, hospitals, et cetera. Why would they not democratically vote for those things to be prioritized? I think it's more crucial that people decide what they want. But more importantly, you're not able to equally demand from the government what you're able to achieve. Because even if on their side, land gets given to like a few people, if on our side, people decide for land reparation, all of the people are able to demand through courts land reparation existing. This means that we're able to not only give the people what they want, improve their situation far worse. And this is why you vote with the opposition. All right, thank you very much for that speech. And now for the final speech of the debate, we return to the prop reply. Good luck. I just find that I'm horrible.
inside Affirmative wants to talk about patronizing, then they are clearly the ones that have lost this debate. Because they are the ones in this debate that are saying that the only way Africa can function is from a Western imported liberal democracy and at the expense of life and starvation, that is what they have to contend with this debate. They are the ones who lose on their own principle. Three questions I'm going to answer in this speech. First, which set of rights is more likely to be sustained? Secondly, who brings the greatest immediate benefit? And finally, do economic reparations lead to political rights? Firstly, which set of rights is likely to be sustained? And I'm starting with this, and it's important, because all of opposition's material are actually contingent on these rights actually being sustained. And note that this notably deals with their principle, because there is no self-determination if democracy does not work. There is no self-determination if people starve and they die. They start this off by saying a few red herrings. Their first line of attack is that they say that because you have the same power means that it has the same level of enforceability. This falls down in three ways. The first thing that we explain at first is to say that it's not just about the power, but it's about the will of the person to actually implement that policy correctly. And to the extent that you are directly giving away power, that is unlikely to be done in a way that's particularly good. We point to the example of in Uganda of Kwame Nkrumah, this opposition has not responded to. The second thing that we point out is that it's not just about instituting rights, but it's about people actively engaging with it. And to the extent that we point out that this system is one that is seen as particularly colonial come, because it comes from this Western background, people are unlikely to have the sort of faith that this opposition would require to actually have an effective democracy. The third thing that we explain is that notice the extent you have to believe opposition's rights to fail is exceptionally low. Because we point out all down the bench that failing one right necessitates failing many others, whereas even if they can mitigate some of our benefits in terms of not getting land reparations, still getting cash transfers, that is clearly something that we're still on top of in this debate. All of that is to say that the world of this opposition is not a functioning democracy. Because we point out it's easy to miscount votes. As we point out it's easy to gerrymander. We point out that there are all these reasons and all these ways that the people in power can skew it and they have the incentive to do so, meaning that they do not get the democracy they want. The second line of attack is that they say what's well, constitu constitutional, but that ignores the fact we give you all these reasons why that constitution, while it may exist, is unlikely to be applied correctly. The third line of attack is to keep talking about Zimbabwe, but we note from first that this is out of the debate because Mugabe would not implement either policy under our, either side successfully, which is to say that it is symmetric, which means that you cannot weigh that. The final line of attack is to say that we implemented poorly because they, we lack land courts. We would note this is a prioritized debate. Perhaps we can have land courts, but we would prioritize the economic reparations, reparations and that is what this opposition has to deal with. So with that in mind, they cannot claim any of their benefits on democracy if they can they're incredibly marginal and you have to weigh that up against what i'm about to tell you so who brings more the greatest immediate benefit and this is crucial because of the 51 nations in africa that are not functioning democracies they're still waiting they're still starving and opposition does nothing even taking opposition is the best they have not answered why it is worth waiting decades for people to stop starving we point to the fact that 1.2 million people have starved in ethiopia and that is the reality and that is what this opposition has to defend which they have not the very benefit of humanization is not enough to overcome death itself because you cannot feel humanized if you are dead. You cannot gain that benefit mentally if you are someone who is no longer living because you have starved. At the end of that, that is clearly the greatest way that we win this debate. And this opposition has no response other to say that maybe in a few years, maybe in a few decades, we might be able to get change. We get it right now. We save those lives. Finally, do economic reparations lead to political rights? And notably, this allows us to win on this opposition's metric. Because we explain that you can only access political rights if you are not starving. Because the right to vote means nothing if you are too hungry to lift the ballot paper. Because the right to freedom of press means nothing if you are illiterate, because you are not given an education, because you're incredibly poor. Note that we also explain that wealth can be used to influence these sort of political systems. And that necessarily means that we're actually able to get these changes better than this opposition. Not under the, this opposition, they have not been able to contend with their own realistic characterization. They say that we are the side shooting people, but that for some reason they're able to get people to perfectly follow constitutions which are written out and taught against their power. At the end of this debate, economic reparations are the prerequisite for all benefits. Life itself is what is most important, and that's what we defend on side promises. All right, thank you very much for that speech and thank you all for the debate. I will now uh, end the recording.